I'm Father Robert Lawton, president of Loyola Marymount University, a university proud and fortunate to be in Los Angeles. I've been lucky enough to live much of my life in great world cities. I grew up on the East Coast, lived in Washington, New York, Boston. Then I moved to Europe, lived in Munich and Berlin, Florence and Rome. All these are great world cities, but they're old as great world cities. And I used to think sometimes when I was in them, what would it have been like to live in one of these cities when it was in its youth as a great world city? Well, now I get that chance. Los Angeles is a great world city, arguably the great world city, and yet it's in its youth, or maybe in its adolescence, full of optimism and energy and hope and great spirit. And so in studying this great and wonderful city, we're studying not only the city itself, but the modern world, because that's what great cities do. They live very intensely, the modern world. And in a city like Los Angeles, uh, it also lives the future as well. The future feels closer in Los Angeles than anywhere else. So this urban lecture series studies the city, but it studies our world, it studies our future. I hope that you enjoy today's lecture. All right, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the election. There was an election on Tuesday for the uh, city of Los Angeles and about uh, 20 other cities in Los Angeles County and many other cities across the state of California. Municipal elections are notorious for low turnout. Uh, what we did here is very quickly put some uh, results. All the people who are listed here were the winners and that or if they received less than 50 percent, there's a runoff which will be on May 19th. We expect a much higher turnout in, on May 19th. Typically, we don't. What happens is you have a very low turnout in the uh, municipal uh, primary and then an even lower turnout in the general election if there's not the executive, meaning the mayor is in a runoff because there will be very few elections on there. However, on May 19th this year is when the state has put uh, about six initiatives uh, tied to the budget uh, compromise. So you will be asked to vote. The whole state is going to be asked to vote on May 19th on uh, seven, I think it's six or seven initiatives, I've uh, lost count. And so on that same day, we will have the runoff for city attorney and in District 5, Council District 5, and then also a, a, uh, two of the LA Community College districts are going to be in runoffs because uh, they did not receive 50%. Uh, Although they came, the two leaders came, became very close. One had 48% and the other one 49. So a little bit more percentage than they would have won outright. So these are all nonpartisan elections, which one of the progressive reforms in the state of California. For local politics, you cannot run uh, as a Republican or a Democrat with that designation on, on, on the ballot. It is a way to keep uh, party politics out of local elections and a way to keep uh, uh, patronage and those type of things that the progressives um, uh, passed back in the early 1900s. Um, the, uh, of course, the big uh, uh, surprise was that uh, many of us expected the mayor to receive more than 55%. Uh, we expected around 60%. So that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, city attorney race, Jack Weiss, is currently a council member in the 5th District. We expected him to possibly win or at least be in the mid-40s, and he only got to the um, uh, 36%. So we certainly expected in the 5th District that there would be a runoff because there were six very competitive candidates running. And so as you can see, even the, vote, the high vote getter only got 23, 24 percent of, uh, of the vote. So that's an interesting race uh, to look at. Um, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we talked about the political diversity and you'll see the continuation of increasing uh, um, uh, uh, minorities winning uh, on the, in the school district. You not only have Monica Garcia winning re-election, but you have Nuri Martinez. Now, that race is actually still too close to call because there's still like 40,000 ballots that haven't been uh, counted. So there's the theoretical possibility that she could actually lose that election, but most of us don't think she will. She would be the third Latina on a, uh, a board of seven. So it's going to be uh, that continuation of more uh, minorities winning. One interesting thing in District 5, that district, if you remember from that presentation three weeks ago, uh, has been held by uh, someone of Jewish descent since 1953, okay? Uh, David Vahidi is not Jewish, and if he were to win, he'd be the first non-Jew since 1953 to win that uh, seat. Uh, Paul Koretz, who is Jewish, a former uh, state legislator and a former city council member of the city of West Hollywood. And so he'd be interesting uh, that he has, will have represented two different cities in his, po in his political life. 
Okay. This uh, 3.8 million people live in the city of Los Angeles. Actually, we estimate that it's actually above 4 million now, but this is the latest uh, census data. Of those, if we take out just the people under 18 children, those who are adults, it's 2.8 million. So we have a million children, a million individuals under the age of 18 who live in the city of Los Angeles. And 1.9 are what we call citizen adults. So that means that we have 900,000 non-citizen adults who live in the city of Los Angeles. So you can see the decreasing uh, in terms of the, the eligible. And then finally, of the 1,900, uh, excuse me, of the 1.9 million who are eligible to vote, only 1.6 million have actually registered to vote. And out of the 1.6 million who are registered to vote, only 300,000 voted. Actually, a little bit less than that. We just rounded up to make even numbers. So you can see what we talked about in, in, in terms of turnout. But there, there you see the universe and how those numbers decline. And this here we have, we talked about the city of LA, the school district, which stands for LA Unified School District, and the LA CCD stands for the LA Community College District. Those, both of those districts are larger than the city. They represent about uh, 20 to 25 other cities in the, in the region that belong to LA Unified. So cities like San Fernando and uh, Huntington Park, Lomita, uh, places like that are part of the LA Unified, okay? And then even uh, LA Community College, even Palos Verdes Peninsula and places like that are also part of that, of that district. Uh, at the polls, meaning people who actually literally went to a polling place, uh, 171,000 voted there. And then over in the uh, vote by mail, we had 88,000 for a total ballot of 259,000. That represents the results that we showed you. But you saw that I had indicated 300,000 people voted. We still have about 40,000 uncounted ballots, meaning that they're provisional, they were vote by mail, and they just haven't been counted yet. So they have a, uh, we don't expect them to change uh, many of the results with the possible exception of Proposition B and the, uh, uh, the uh, school board race. Um, okay, Down here uh, in the 2009 election, only the city of LA voters, not those that are part of the uh, school district and very similar uh, thing, uh, uh, turnout. The graph over here is we see the, the turnout rate during the primary election. So today we have 15. We're actually at the Center for the Study of LA predicting that's gonna ultimately be 18% when you count all the other votes. So these are only 15% of, uh, of the, the votes. That's the 259. When it gets to 300,000, it'll rise to 18%, but still be the lowest election, uh, lo the lowest turnout in recorded history in the city of Los Angeles. We had the highest number of Americans who have ever voted in the history of the nation in November, and then we end up with the lowest uh, turnout uh, that we've had in the city of Los Angeles. Could be election fatigue, it could be they're just not interested in the city of LA, uh, who, who knows, they could be depressed because of the economy, or they're so happy with the mayor of Antonio Villaraigosa that they figured he was gonna win anyway, but what the heck, we don't, I'd rather go to Starbucks than go vote, or something like that. Okay. And then here's uh, a trend that we've been watching uh, um, statewide, but also in the, in the city. Again, this is just the primary elections in the city of Los Angeles. So this last one, 34%, excuse me, 34% of uh, all voters voted by mail. Four years ago, when Antonio Villaragosa won, it was uh, 27%. And eight years ago, when he ran the first time against uh, James Hahn and lost, it was 24, 25%. So this is a trend that we're seeing throughout the state of California that increasingly more people prefer to vote by mail. I actually got a reporter on election day calling me for a, a quote and all that, and she said she had been standing at a voting place for 35 minutes waiting to interview a voter, and none had come by. Okay? So you combine the low 15% turnout with 33% of those people uh, voting by mail, there's actually very few people showing up to the uh, polling places. It's one of the reasons we did not conduct an exit poll this time. Many of you who participated in those exit polls, you would have been hard pressed to uh, find people that we were uh, trying to, to interview. Okay? So that's what happened in uh, um, some of the numbers that we had for the election on Tuesday. And uh, see that up there. One of the other trends that you can see is that there are 
Um, eight uh, incumbents who were running, all of the incumbents won. Um, there was no incumbent in District 5, that's why we have a runoff. Out of the eight incumbents, excuse me, seven incumbents that won, three of them had absolutely no opposition. They were on the ballot uh, with their name. They, they knew they were going to be elected all, all the way back to November when the, the filing deadline. So what does this say about uh, democracy and how it's practiced in the city of Los Angeles? Are we having too many elections? Do people really care about local politics, um, et cetera? Uh, poll after poll that we conduct both here at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles and th you know, throughout the state, whether it's the Public Policy Institute of California or nationally, when we ask people what is the number one concern that you have, the number one issue that government ought to be dealing with, it, it's always education. For the last 10 years, education is the number one issue, and yet even when we were electing uh, the, the potential impact of, of the school district, which has an $8 billion yearly budget and a $20 billion construction budget for the next couple of years, that, I mean, that's real money. $8 billion is more than the combined national gross product of all of Central America and the Caribbean island nations combined. So LA Unified spends more money in one year than all those 20 nations have in goods and services in their whole economy. And so we're talking about real money that these individuals control and impact, okay? And they also educate 700,000 school children who are in the LA Unified. That's more uh, school children than people who live in the city of San Francisco. And so that, those are very significant numbers that we have, and yet only 15% of the voters uh, thought it was uh, significant enough to come out and, and participate. All right. Um, how much more time I can fill and how much more numbers I can make up. No, it's true, everything I was telling you. Okay. All right. Well, when I, um, what I'm going to do is actually ask two of our guests to come up here and we can talk a little bit about the election and start talking while we wait for the um, supervisor to uh, uh, come up here. The Urban Lecture Series 2009, sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Um, first, I'm going to introduce one of my uh, colleagues who is here at Loyola Marymount University. This is Dr. Michael Genovese, who holds the Loyola Chair of Leadership Studies at Loyola Marymount University and is also the director of the Institute for Leadership. Uh, he is one of our more accomplished professors, has won all kinds of teaching awards, not only here at Loyola Marymount, but from the American Political Science Association. Uh, he's also an author of over 13 books. Yes, he has no life. Um, is, uh, he, he's one of our, our, our more prolific uh, authors. Many of you have had him as a professor and have read some of his books from both in his classes and other classes that uh, we offer. Um, making that up because I can't even find my... Uh, bio on him. I think I have it right here. Um, besides all that, he, he's, a, he's a good guy, okay? Because he, he also voted for me to get a job here when I, when I got here. Um, so um, this is Dr. Michael Genovese. Uh, next to him is Philip Reck. He is a uh, attorney with the law firm of Mayor Brown here in Los Angeles. Uh, he is, uh, has been, he's got extensive government uh, experience. Prior to joining the firm, he worked as Chief Counsel and Deputy Administrator for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the U.S. Department of Transportation during the Clinton uh, years. He also worked as a Legislative Assistant in the Office of U.S. Congressman David Cornwell from Indiana, I believe, uh, and as consultant to the Joint Center for Political Studies in Washington, D.C. Many of you students who took my class last semester remember that center because we used a lot of their data for our research project that year. And he was also legislative aide with the office of U.S. Rep. John Moakley from Massachusetts. He's uh, educated at the University of Pennsylvania for law school, and he went to uh, Yale University for his B.A., where he graduated cum laude. He's also been admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth and Federal Circuits, the U.S. Court for the Central, Northern, and Southern Districts of California, and of course, the, uh, in California as well. He's done quite a bit of publications, and currently he continues his public service, even though he's a, a lawyer in private practice, by serving as the, uh, on the Transportation Commission for the City of Los Angeles, which is a mayoral appointee. And I think you're the vice chair, or the chair? I was. Okay. 
And then he's also I, on the, uh, which we want to talk a little bit about, the Central Cities Association of Los Angeles, where you were the uh, uh, vice chair, I think you're now the chair of the Central Cities, what we call CCA, a very important uh, organization for the development of, of downtown uh, Los Angeles. Um, Mike, let me begin with you and talk a little bit about these numbers. I know you're, you, you, you focus on national and international affairs, you focus on the, on the presidency, but when you take a look at these numbers, especially in the context of the Obama election and, and the great numbers that we saw there. What, what, what comes to your mind? What's the explanation for such a low turnout? Uh, I think there are a couple of factors involved. One is that... Uh, uh, I think one of the factors involved is that in the United States we have more elections than virtually any other country. And Fernando mentioned election fatigue. Uh, the, the, my favorite story is, is told by a good friend, Matt Streb, who uh, has a lecture based on an election in a county in Texas where they have an election for the weigher of fruits and vegetables, as if there were a Democratic position on what a pound is and a Republican position on what, what me, a pound measurement is. Uh, we have elections for everything, and it's partly a function of, of our belief in democracy. We believe in it so much we'll send people abroad to fight wars to impose it on countries, and yet we don't believe in it enough to practice it. And so that would be point one. The second point I'd make is to show you, students, young people, who are ambitious and want to get involved in politics, how easy it can be to get elected in some cases. Because it doesn't take a real lot. 15% of the vote. You go out and walk your district, build an organization, you can win local elections. You can get involved in the process. It's a lot easier than you think. And you look at it on TV and you see you know, the big players and you see the, the national politics played out. That's tough to get involved in. But if you want to run for local offices in small cities, especially in off-year elections, you really can do it. You can win elections in your 20s. And so uh, th th in a way, that's the, the good news. But on the whole, I think it's bad news that, uh, that we don't participate that much. Because if we don't, we cede that responsibility to others who have a, a, a definite self-interest. Uh, and, and I think that that's, has a corrosive effect on our faith in government, our belief in democracy. So Phil, what's your take? I mean, I think I should also mention that the law firm where Mr. Recht uh, currently is also has uh, Mickey Cantor, the former <coughs> U.S. Trade Representative, uh, Bob Hertzberg, the former Speaker of the State Assembly, uh, Dario Fromer, who's also an Assembly member, um, probably a couple of others that I don't know, but those are just the ones I could, oh, uh, Tim Acosker, who was Chief of Staff to Mayor Hahn, and before that, a uh, City Attorney. So um, it, it, it's, uh, you, you guys hire all these former uh, uh, <laughs> politicians who can't, get a, who can't get elected anymore, or how does that work? That, 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 that's what I was about to say. We take them in off the street and, uh, and, and give them a real job. Um, let me just say on the election, uh, I, I agree with what you said. Uh, I think that local elections um, traditionally get lower turnout than national elections. I think this national election was about as exciting as it's ever going to get. Um, we had a record turnout, and, and I think because the process started so early and it was so dramatic that there was burnout, and I think the local election paled in comparison. And particularly since there wasn't a fight at the top of the ticket in the mayor's race, I think for most people, and, and there, were, there was only really one council district that was competitive, and the other citywide offices just didn't seem real exciting. I, I think there were, uh, people just didn't feel motivated to get to the polls, and, and I, I think we got what we got. Um, as for our law firm, um, we bring in a lot of people who are lawyers who like to move in and out of government and the law. Um, I've done it a number of times, and um, it's, it, it's what we do, and we've built a law practice around um, our experience and, and in, the, in the government, and uh, it's, uh, it's great to have this crowd of people in there because it's, it's its own little political shop. But that's not all your law firm does. No, they practice no. all the other traditional law, but they have a unit where you right. and a couple of others are in, in terms of that. It used to be traditional. I mean, at one point, it was as high as 35% or so that many state legislatures in the U.S. Congress, we had uh, lawyers. And now that's actually declined quite a bit. Um, so is it, uh, it, it what, what explains that? Well, it, there was actually just, I saw an article just recently that showed in the state legislature, the number of lawyers has declined 
by you know 100 percent or something it used to be 50 now it's 20 members of the legislature are lawyers in the la city council um, there's two lawyers now but in past years there have been much more um, i think people are just finding uh, elected office less appealing than it used to than it used to be um, i think Partly also the laws become pretty lucrative. Um, and I think also going into elective office, let me go back to why it's not so appealing, um, the scrutiny that is given to people now compared to 10 years ago uh, is, is quite different. And uh, I think virtually any blemish on somebody's career or life or tax returns, um, I think, particularly if you're a lawyer and you're associated with a big law firm, our law firm has 1,800 lawyers. It's the ninth largest law firm 1800 in the world. 1,800 lawyers. Ninth largest in the world. We have offices all over the place. And so you're not really that special then? No, I guess not. But um, <laughs> one of 1,800. But I dare say that if I or So just one more thing about the um, uh, city uh, attorneys. When you run for attorney general, district attorney, or city attorney, it is required that you be an attorney. So right now we're having a, um, a, a city election for city attorney, and there's going to be a runoff on May 19th with council member Jack Weiss, who is an attorney, right. and uh, 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 Trutanich, uh, who's, a, I think, a district attorney right now, a deputy district attorney. No, he, he was. He's in a private law firm. Okay. But the big issue there is going to be some of his clients, they, exactly. and, he's already, and he's already getting hit for that because the, the, the law firm represented uh, the National Rifle Association and, and a couple of others, and even though he didn't work on it directly, there's still going to be the, the, the uh, uh, association that's going to be made by the other, the other campaign. So it, it, those you can't get away. It has to be an attorney who, who, who runs for the, those elections. So. That's ex exactly correct. So let, let's move uh, over to the uh, uh, Obama administration. You served in the Clinton administration. Um, in terms of uh, um, when you were asked to serve and how, how did that whole process proceed for you personally? Uh, <clears throat> I'd worked in the campaign. I was the lawyer for the California campaign, so I, I was involved pretty early on. And uh, the Clinton campaign nationally was very California heavy. This fellow, Mickey Cantor, uh, who you mentioned, uh, who was a law partner of mine, uh, initially put the California campaign together, but he was very close to the president and became the national co-chair of the campaign. Um, and when the election was over and Clinton won, I and others, I think, who were involved were asked if we want to come back, and I, I said, yes, I'd love to. And then it took a year and a half um, to get back <laughs> for me. Um, but what, the, what do you mean it took a year and a half? Well, the process of filling these jobs, as we're observing with Obama, is slow at best. The cabinet jobs get filled right away because you need a government in place, at least at these top levels, uh, uh, quickly. But to get to what we call the sub-cabinet jobs and below um, can be an extremely slow process because what happens is the president, the day he's sworn in, um, starts meeting with his cabinet and has to start acting. And to the extent that he has people in place, they immediately start getting distracted with the actual business of government and find themselves having less and less time to worry about vetting people, choosing the right people, and getting them appointed. So uh, everybody has their own story. Mine was I was picked or slotted for one position, but some things changed in the plans. There was the Justice Department. And then it, I got a call one day from a young fellow working in the White House personnel office, and he said, um, we'd like you to come be the chief counsel of NHTSA. What do you say? And I said, what's NHTSA? And he told me what this agency was. I said, I've never heard of it. Um, it, it, it how can you possibly choose me or, or ask me? He goes, well, you're perfect. I said, how could I be perfect? I know absolutely nothing about this subject matter. And he said, that's what we want. 
um, anybody who does know something about this subject matter is going to be uh, vetoed essentially by the stakeholder interest groups. But you have the right kind of background, legal background, and you'll pick up the subject matter and you come with a clean slate and therefore nobody knows yet to dislike you or to, to, to think you're not, you're not going to serve their interests. It was interesting to me um, because as a lawyer we sell expertise and now I'm selling a lack of expertise. But as it turned out, it, it worked out. And so it took a year and a half. You had to fill out the application. You had to go through all kinds of different uh, vetting process. What were some of the steps? Well, it took a year and a half to get the call for them to identify this job. Um, then <laughs> once I did that, um, after I got the call, it was about three months, uh, filling out applications. They, they did an FBI background check. I had to get secret clearance. Um, come back and interview for it, um, and then, you know, disentangling from your life here and getting there, um, it took a while. Um, but I will say that as I wasn't the last person to get a job there. I was actually considered to be among the earlier, um, the first round of people into the administration. It, it was just a very slow process. My hope for Obama, for what it's worth, is that they can move more quickly. I think they got off to a quick start. But I think they've stalled a little bit, and, and my hope is they, they can get back on pace. Dr. Genovese, why can't we have a shadow government, something like in Britain, where it just steps in the minute it happens? Well, part, part of it is history. Part of it is a, fun a function of the fact that we developed a looser party system, less programmatic, less ideological, um, never developed the same kinds of traditions that they have in Britain. Whereas in Great Britain, what you've got is basically a parallel universe. You've got all the office holders, and the opposition party has a matching member of the House of Commons who basically is the shadow minister for transportation, defense, or whatever. And their responsibility is to shadow the government in power and to basically be the spokesperson for the opposition. And so it's a very organized system, and it's a very good system, and it's one in which Governments can change overnight, and you don't have similar problems that you have in the U.S. of basically reinventing the wheel almost every four or eight years. Um, uh, and so we never developed that tradition. We, we, never, we won't because our party system is, is so vastly different. Uh, but there's a lot to recommend such a, uh, such a system. We just never have developed along those lines. Well, I want to welcome uh, Mark Ridley Thomas, who is currently the uh, supervisor in uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, he was uh, sworn in in uh, December. Uh, previously to that, he was a state senator up in uh, Sacramento. Uh, and before that, he served two terms in the state assembly. And before that, he was an LA uh, city council member uh, from 1991, I think, to the uh, 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 present. Um, he has uh, been a fixture in LA politics. He's also probably one of the best elected officials in terms of getting, getting the community involved in terms of the uh, empowerment neighborhoods that he established and has, uh, I think, really used that as a platform for policy, for civic engagement, and also for uh, elective office. Um, I can tell you about all the other uh, um, committees that he served on, and the, the, we have to spend the rest of the evening uh, just talking about that. Um, so he's uh, also the... Uh, uh, parent of uh, uh, twin boys who are in college right now, somewhere out of the state. Uh, I don't know why you sent them out of the state. Um, they wanted to come to Loyola Marymount University, but he wouldn't let them. Uh, they both There's no place like Morehouse College. That's all to it. Yeah. Uh, uh, he is, uh, they also went to Loyola High School, so they have some Jesuit tradition in them. Um, he uh, Finally, one last thing about uh, Supervisor Mark Willie Thomas. He does have a PhD from uh, USC, so he's we have to call him the Honorable Dr. Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas. So when you ask, stand up to ask a question, remember it's Honorable Dr. Uh, <laughs> Supervisor uh, Mark Ridley Thomas. Um, uh, Supervisor, just a, a couple of questions before you came in. We talked a little bit about the election that just happened on Tuesday, and we asked uh, about any uh, surprises, uh, what, what was uh, g going on. Are, are you surprised by number one, uh, Mayor Villaraigosa only getting 55 percent. Are you surprised by the turnout of only 15, although we estimate that it will end up being 18 percent? Um, are you surprised about anything that happened on, on, on Tuesday? And by the way, did you vote? 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it's actually public record whether you voted or not. Uh, we can check on every single one of you. Yes, I'm fully aware of that. Um, <laughs> uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, Professor, thank you for your invitation. I want to give a shout out to Bill Fitzgerald from the top. Uh, long-time uh, colleague and supporter. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, knowing him when I was teaching high school. Uh, a couple of his daughters were uh, students of mine, uh, and I'm a better person for it. Um, did I vote? I'm what's called a, a religious voter, uh, a pathological voter. Uh, I vote when there's no good reason to vote. <laughs> um, and so, yes, uh, I, um, I did vote uh, to the question, am I surprised by uh, election results? Uh, uh, professor, I am too old to be surprised by anything at this point in my journey. Um, and uh, the descriptor that you uh, use to say only 55% uh, is a loaded editorial, Fernando, and I'm not going to bite. Uh, I'm a tenured professor. I'm allowed to ask loaded questions. Uh, yes, and I'm a tenured uh, elected official, so I know how to dodge uh, loaded questions. <laughs> um, but I will say this, as I did say to uh, Mr. Viragosa. Uh, you know, voters uh, respond uh, to that which is in many respects of moment in the context of a campaign. So campaigns are, if nothing else, <coughs> contextual. Uh, and it is not to be assumed that um, a phenomenon of an all-time high that might have occurred in uh, November will necessarily be transferable to what will take place uh, several months later, uh, call it March. Um, I said to the mayor uh, that from my point of view, what uh, has to happen is a sustained investment in civic engagement. And that's essentially what the Empowerment Congress seeks to do. Not ballot related, but to keep uh, the citizenry uh, involved in the life of the city. Um, absent such an investment, you get a 15, call it an 18 percent turnout. You know, that, that's hard to do. You have done it. Yeah. And you're one of the very few elected officials who've done it. There, there is this old theory that once elected, it's dangerous for an elected official to continue to mobilize citizens because you might mobilize them against you. You might mobilize them to be interested, to be civically engaged, and they may boot you out of office. So there's the theory that many electeds don't like voter registration, don't like to do that. Um, do you buy that theory? I do not, and it contradicts my experience. Well, your individual experience, but how about some of your colleagues on councils, state legislatures, uh, board of supervisors? If they were to do as I have sought to do, I think they would be surprised by the benefits uh, related to an investment in civic engagement. Um, it is almost um, cynical in some respects uh, to uh, be um, afforded an opportunity to serve. Uh, and as soon as one um, is extended that privilege, um, you shut down the process uh, that keeps uh, democracy alive. Um, and I have to say to you that this is precisely uh, the sentiment that drives term limits. Um, uh, voters do not have a high estimate, uh, a particularly high estimate of uh, elected officials, as is indexed in any number of surveys, many of which have done, been done right here at this center, uh, uh, because of uh, the sense that elected officials seek to 
engage in ag um, aggrandizement and uh, the amassing of power uh, and to cloak any uh, semblance of transparency and as a result it feeds a high level of suspicion and distrust in the electorate. Anybody here have a suspicion about any elected officials that you know other than the one that's in the room right now? Um, and so this is the essentially uh, hugely uh, important concern in terms of the corrosive effect that it has on the democratic process itself. Um, let me just ask you a couple more political questions before we go to our topic about the Obama administration and California and LA County. You are now a supervisor in Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County, if it were a state, it would be the eighth or ninth largest state. Exactly. If its budget is bigger than, you know, 42 states in the union. It is, it is gigantic. In your district alone, you represent over 2 million people. Correct. That's more than 20 U.S. senators represent. You represent more people than 20% of the senators currently in office, or 10 governors as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is an important, incredibly gigantic uh, um, uh, position. Um, I know you've only been in office a couple of months, so I'm not going to ask you what you've done for us. Um, but um, uh, what has surprised you the most in this just three or four months that you've been in office compared to being in the state leg legislature and at city council? Uh, I, I appreciate the question. This is, um, as you uh, note, um, well, the fourth uh, public office uh, that I have held. Uh, and each instance is uh, different. Uh, I was on a body of 15 people uh, when I served on the city council from 91 to 2002. Uh, and then uh, when being elected to the state assembly, um, uh, it was a body of 80 uh, elected officials uh, plus uh, the 40 uh, uh, senators in the upper house, as it is often referred to. Um, and then when moving from the assembly to the Senate, uh, again, the 40. And now uh, on the Board of Supervisors, five. Uh, and so it's just interesting to... Uh, uh, situate yourself in the context of those kinds of uh, numerics. Um, I suspect that the thing that, uh, if we look at the entirety of my journey um, uh, to date, the real uh, surprise was when I moved from the Assembly to the, uh, the Senate, uh, because you would think um, or at least that was I only did. like that was only a hundred yards away. Yeah, uh, young, uh, yeah, exactly, right across the hall on the same floor. But I had to uh, change all the furniture um, in the district office because they are two separate and distinct organizations in terms of uh, their funding, in terms of their organization, in terms of their culture. So that was the most uh, surprising thing. Uh, the assembly is driven more in terms of um, uh, electronics, in terms of how you vote. Um, in, the, uh, in the Senate, uh, you have a, a voice roll call. And so if you are not there, you miss the opportunity to vote. And there is no opportunity, uh, for all intents and purposes, to uh, recoup that loss. On the assembly side, you... Uh, are supposed to be there and um, uh, you press your button. If you're not there, your seatmate is in some instances permitted to do so if you are on a restroom break or whatever else may be the case that is uh, uh, an unmentionable. But the point that I wish to make here is that uh, very different uh, uh, dynamics uh, operating in those two bodies. Here, on the Board of Supervisors, uh, as uh, some of you know and appreciate, uh, this is a very unusual uh, form of government. Uh, checks and balances are at, a, at an all-time minimum, as it were. Uh, the Board of Supervisors, by 
uh, Constitution and our charter uh, throughout the state of California essentially represents the executive and the legislative branch of government and some quasi-judicial uh, responsibilities. Uh, Bill, that doesn't say a whole lot for checks and balances at that point. Uh, it is, from that uh, vantage point, a very uh, unusual, you might say anom uh, anomalous and to some extent arguably anti-democratic form of government, small d. Uh, why? Because uh, the time-tested tradition of checks and balances is conspicuously absent when, uh, absent when uh, one person or five persons can make uh, a final decision without it going to the executive branch of government uh, for a review and or rejection called a veto. So I can't help myself. I have to ask you about the election. Um, you won the election with like over 60 percent of the vote. Correct. But a lot of the controversy was the amount of money that the union spent on behalf of your election. I think over eight million, which I think is a, a record spent by any organization for local office in the United States and a record that probably won't be broken for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So people now expect that if some group spent eight million dollars on your behalf, that you're going to be responsive to that group. And that, well, frankly, they're saying that you will now vote the union line because of that. How do you respond to people like me who bring that question up? Um, I'm glad you're my friend, uh, <laughs> is how I respond to that. Um, it would probably be a more inelegant way of posing the question, uh, but I appreciate the fact that you didn't. The fact of the matter is, uh, you are absolutely correct. It was an unusual set of circumstances, um, uh, and if there is a, a hunch that it will uh, repeat itself in the near term, that probably isn't the case. Uh, I believe in this uh, particular instance, uh, organized labor was part particularly motivated and be reminded of what I said earlier about the contextual nature of elections. They were particularly motivated in this instance because of uh, the fact that the principal uh, opponent in the race uh, was viewed as being so irretrievably anti-labor. Uh, and they could not, in their mind, run the risk of allowing uh, that seat uh, to be won by someone who credentialed himself in that manner, at least from their perspective, and uh, to that extent then uh, tipped the balance of power on the Board of Supervisors uh, in a way that they would have to live with for more uh, than a decade. Uh, my job um, is to represent, as I see it, uh, my constituents. Uh, which uh, it should be noted that this is the district that is the most uh, diverse among the five. And uh, my uh, tenure in public office has been to essentially represent uh, my uh, constituents in a very balanced and, and forceful way uh, because I believe that that's what I'm elected uh, to do. Uh, labor is among my uh, constituencies. Uh, and I would say to you further, that it has, the second district has the largest concentration of labor households. So if I vote for labor, I'm essentially voting for my constituents. And if people don't understand that, then they really don't understand the democratic process and what accountability is about. Let's give the uh, supervisor a little bit of break. Uh, Dr. Genovese, let's start talking about our, our <coughs> subject matter here is the Obama administration, Los Angeles. Um, one of the uh, frustrations about running city government that uh, Supervisor really Thomas, when he was a council member, and, and even now, is the, um, a lot of what happens is not really in the control of the city or the county. So for instance, immigration, that's certainly one, one of the issues. Counties and cities are asked to respond to that, yet they don't control immigration policy, et cetera. Uh, the other is this whole mess that we're in economically. It's been created by nothing that the city didn't regulate any of these institutions. The cities and counties that had none of this issue, yet they have to now respond to that. Um, there is a theory that under the Clinton administration, you know, that Mr. Recht was part of, that California did very well. And he began to kind of answer what, why they did that. But that under the Bush administration, we didn't do so well. And now we're going to do well in the Obama administration. Can you expand on that a little bit? I think 
<laughs> uh, it's absolutely true. It's a, uh, it's a, partly a function of uh, Democrats <coughs> controlling a blue state, and you help your friends, and you don't help your enemies, your adversaries. Uh, Cal as California has been a strongly democratic state, President Clinton recognized that that was a very fertile ground for fundraising, for gaining support, for a whole variety of things. Uh, and when President Bush was in office, uh, he recognized the political reality. He can just do the math. The, the California has, has not been going Republican. Uh, the last time it went presidentially was 1988 when his father won it. Uh, and, and, and it looks like the future it's going to remain that way. And so uh, I think California will do very well uh, under the Obama administration. And in part as a function of what you mentioned, the, the terrible economic times we're in, where money is going to be funneled from the feds to the local government. The really delicious irony here is that since the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was elected, who used to, his message was, well, government's not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. We started to uh, 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 ignore some of the big problems that were building up. And one of the things that people have been talking about, and Mark Ridley Thomas knows this better than anyone, is the decline of our infrastructures, uh, bridges, roads, you name it. Um, and so we, we neglected to do the daily maintenance because we, we wanted to suffocate government, uh, not give it the funds. Uh, budget deficits did that. Um, now what we're going to be doing is what we should have been doing all along. We're going to do it all at once. Uh, we're going to funnel a lot of money in for uh, public works projects, for infrastructure rebuilding. So California has a potential to really do very well on that. Uh, you've got two senators from California. You've got control of the California co coalition by the Democrats in the House. You've got most of the local governments, uh, big governments are Democrats and friends of the presidents. And so uh, you expect <coughs> in politics to help your friends and uh, California's got a good friend in Washington. Um, Phil, was there any sense when you were in DC that California was, was supposed to be looked after? I mean, you were a Californian, you obviously had all your contacts in California, but it, it, was there some informal way that that was communicated to you? Um, no, I, nobody, Nobody ever came to me and said, keep an eye out on California, but I don't think anybody had to in a way. Um, the Clinton, and, I would say Bill Clinton viewed California almost as his adopted home state, Personally, certainly his politically adopted home state uh, once he got past Arizona, I mean Arkansas. He just loved it here. And so much of his campaign team came from California. Um, I mean, I was making a list before I came in here. There were dozens upon dozens of Californians, many from LA, who were serving in very high levels in the Clinton administration. On top of it, the Clinton administration did something that I'd never seen happen before. They actually had a California desk in the, in the, in the uh, uh, White House, in the political affairs office. Uh, a fellow from LA, many of us know, named John Emerson, actually uh, held that position for a long time. Um, and I think Bill Clinton and that administration was determined to do well by California. And you know, I could give you a, a lot of examples of, about the things they did, but California benefited extraordinarily. I mean, just think of two things that went on. One, the earth, earthquake response. Now certainly this administration, Clinton administration, um, prided itself in disaster response with Jamie Lee Witt and FEMA, but there was nothing ever done since then, before or after, like the earthquake response, there were 16 billion dollars pumped into the LA area um, in about a six month period. All kind of rules were waived, like SBA loan limits, so that small businesses in the valley uh, could, could qualify quickly for loans. Uh, LA was designated uh, as an empowerment zone, so it could get loans and grants. I mean, it was just extraordinary. They sent John Emerson out to, to be on the ground here for those months to make sure it was happening. The Alameda Corridor was another example. Um, billions of dollars were cobbled together uh, out of discretionary pots of money in the Department of Transportation and elsewhere so that this project could be funded. It's not to say it wasn't a worthy project. It was. But it was an enormous priority for the Clinton administration to get that done, and we've benefited enormously since. So the hope is we'll do as well. But Clinton made a special, there was a very special commitment to this state. 
So yeah, even no, though at that time the mayor of Los Angeles was actually a Republican during the Northridge uh, earthquake, mm -hmm. and even though right now the governor of California is a Republican, they still see California worthy of investment. What would you suggest or recommend to people in Washington in terms of what areas would, uh, would the money uh, not only have an impact but also have a long-term impact that, that it's not just an investment of, hey, let's throw some money in there, but it would really uh, um, have an impact on the state of California? Well, I, I, I agree with the professor on infrastructure. I, I think our state's infrastructure has uh, fallen into significant disrepair. Um, uh, other states with which we compete, other countries with which we compete are making much more significant investments. And this is really the golden opportunity. Um, this year, in 2009 alone, the highway, the, the, the surface transportation bill and the FAA airline or the airport transportation bills, these bills are coming up for what's called reauthorization. So they're going to be rewritten. And there is an opportunity to put more money out for these subjects, to change some of the funding formulas so California is no longer what we call a donor state, right? To allow for uh, discretionary grant programs that favor California and allow us to compete. Uh, this, to me, is really the big area, and I'll just add one thing to it. Um, this Measure R that passed recently uh, was an enormously beneficial thing to our region. Uh, we're going to have $40 billion in funds to spend on transportation projects in the region over the next 10 years. And there are real opportunities in Washington now to help even accelerate and build upon this commitment that we've made locally to tax ourselves to raise this money. Uh, and my, my hope is the administration will do it because infrastructure improvements uh, have an enormous multiplier effect in terms of jobs and commerce, and they last for a long time, and, and that's what I think they need to focus on. So, Supervisor, before I ask you about infrastructure, because um, for you being a supervisor, you're automatically on the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority Board, which builds all of the um, uh, light rail and, and uh, um, subways. Um, Buses. And, and buses, yeah. Um, the, your, one of your colleagues uh, in, in the newspaper today, in the LA Times, uh, there was a story about uh, Supervisor Don Kanabi uh, talking that LA could create 10,000 temporary jobs with the stimulus funds. Um, what's your response to that? Is that, that, that uh, something that you're going to be able to support? Well, um, absolutely. Um, the uh, stimulus uh, package, as it's often referred to, um, might best be thought of in terms of recovery, economic recovery, um, as a way to deal with the severity of the crisis that has enveloped uh, uh, the nation's economy. Uh, but it uh, ought to also be appreciated, parenthetically, as an international crisis of some consequence. And so uh, there is a well-intentioned uh, and articulated uh, job growth agenda related to uh, the package. Uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, for the county of Los Angeles, uh, there are uh, thousands upon thousands of jobs, not simply of a temporary nature, uh, pursuant to um, our proposal if it is properly uh, awarded. So what um, we've heard quite a bit about Mayor Villaraigosa and then other mayors and other local officials going to uh, Washington, D.C., trying to structure that. <clears throat> Does the County Board of Supervisors, uh, they, do they send one, two, three of you, or do you, do you have a, a, a representative firm that represents your interest over in, in D.C.? How does, how does it work in terms of lobbying Washington and also lobbying Sacramento? Most of the students aren't aware that many local governments actually also lobby for some of this money. Uh, that's correct, uh, Professor Guerrero. And um, uh, the County of Los Angeles has uh, uh, legislative advocates uh, both in the uh, state's capital as well as the nation's capital. Um, and they are full-time lobbyists uh, acting on behalf of the, the County of Los Angeles under the supervision of the county's chief uh, executive uh, officer. Um, and that's essentially how it works. And uh, in addition to that, um, on an annual basis, uh, minimally, uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, um, uh, does um, uh, visit the uh, nation's capital uh, to lobby on a range of issues, and that uh, will certainly be the case in this instance with a 
uh, a long list of particulars uh, to discuss uh, with our uh, senators as well as our, our representatives. So um, when's the last time you talked to uh, Obama, either before the election, after the election? Uh, my recollection is that it was uh, prior uh, to the election, and I told him that you said hello. He, he, he hasn't called me, by the way. All right. I told him it wasn't necessary. Oh, okay. I was carrying the message for you. Uh, my interactions with him have been uh, straightforward and um, um, appropriately uh, direct, and he's been responsive accordingly, and I'm uh, appreciative uh, for his openness, his candor, and it's uh, uh, what he has exuded um, across uh, the face of this nation and essentially, in my view, why he uh, is the, the president of the, of the United States. Did you endorse him in, in the primaries early on? Very early on, yes. I mean, I ask that because many people assume that most African-American uh, elected officials endorsed Obama, but that's not the case. Quite, quite a few uh, African-American members of Congress had endorsed Hillary because she was seen as the one that was going, go, going to win. So Correct. W what about uh, in terms of how Obama did in California? Um, what, why did he do so well? He won something like 61% of the vote here in California, and I think 81% in the city of Los Angeles. Is it just the, the fact that uh, it's, it's a blue state and that was it, or were there other elements that, that led to his, really, a, 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 a tremendous victory? Well, I think uh, it's to be appreciated that um, uh, the state of California is, if nothing else, uh, very complex and in some respects unpredictable. Uh, in terms of how it votes and what it does. I mean, if you look, for example, just a few years ago, uh, this is a uh, state that uh, turned a governor out of office um, and did so because they were restless and upset about uh, several things, um, not the least of which was a so-called uh, card tax. Um, and uh, it should be appreciated that he... Uh, was up against someone who had tremendous uh, star power who called himself a terminator um, and uh, worked that very effectively and had significant appeal in various sectors of the electorate. Um, not the least of which, uh, Professor Guerra, uh, would have been labor households, as is uh, documented, who traditionally would be thought to be uh, hardline, loyal, democratic Households they shifted in that election, so uh, it's not easy always to predict how California is going to be behave. I think uh, Barack Obama had an extraordinarily effective message uh, that connected with people uh, in this state because, if for no other reason, uh, this state uh, sees itself as a state of what's new and what's next. And uh, to the extent that that uh, is the case, uh, Barack Obama was uh, in many ways emblematic, that is to say his campaign was for that which was seen as the future in the most positive and uh, constructive way. He said it in one word, hope. Uh, and he messaged that as effectively as anyone I've seen on the public stage. And he didn't do it from an ideological perspective. And that's why this uh, appeal uh, to bipartisanship is not seen as a ploy. I think it's authentic in terms of what he sees himself as being a consensus builder. And it works uh, uh, pretty effectively. So, uh, Dr. Genovese kind of asked this question of the supervisor about his own experience. But given that you are a scholar of the presidency and you've written uh, extensively, how's Obama doing? Gee, it's been, what, five weeks? Uh, uh, we, no, it's been 44 days for the 44th president. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Uh, uh, obviously, you, you give him an incomplete... I'm not even sure that's the case, but I, I just said it. <laughs> but it sounded good. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you give him an incomplete. Um, I'm not one of the people who uh, drank the Kool-Aid early with Obama, and, and uh, uh, he's winning me over, <coughs> I'll say that. Uh, I'm, I was impressed with his campaign. I was impressed with his own self-discipline. Uh, 
early glitch with some of the appointments, which... But that has, that's happened to every presidency. I mean, I remember the Clinton, it was nanny gate after nanny gate. Which and means you should have been aware that something was going to come down the pipe. Yeah, but and it's always, was, I mean, like, years ago, if you I spoke, don't interrupt you. Well, but the, <laughs> this, is, this is my class. <laughs> um, when we go to your class... Oh, well, okay. it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in early days, if you smoked pot or did anything, you were, like, out. But that, that's not the case anymore. As a matter of fact, most of the nominees have admitted to doing that and so the the those things you know change now you can smoke pot but you can't have an undocumented immigrant be your nanny right. you know so the, the, the things change so next next time yeah we'll make sure that all nominees you know if they have smoked pot let's make sure you say it right away before the press brings it up that you don't have an, a, a, a nanny that you're not paying taxes on and that you paid all your taxes but it'll be something else so it's how do you vet for everything well, you can't, but, and, and it's part of the gotcha politics that we have where we overly personalize things. But there are some pretty obvious standards. The Secretary of Treasury not paying his taxes is just, I mean, how, how do you reconcile that? Um, he, he doesn't know how to reconcile, <coughs> that's why. Um, uh, is that on the president or is that on the nominee? You know, I, 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 I don't know what the, what the process was. I mean, if, if the process, the process should have been able to, to get that out, and, and then they could make a choice, well, do we want to continue with this guy or not? Um, I think, for the most part, I give him very, very high marks. Uh, his, the, uh, the supervisor talked about his, his bipartisanship. Either it's very genuine, in which case that's a real plus, and I think something that really resonates with voters. Even if he's not sincere, it's still a great political ploy because what he'll, he's doing is reaching out to Republicans. If you saw today the uh, health care um, uh, meeting where he had a bunch of Democrats and Republicans in the same room and he was acting like a, a master professor where he's calling on Republicans to talk and it was just, uh, well, it was like the poster boy for bipartisanship. That's pretty good because we mostly don't call on Republicans when no, our we, class went to talk. <laughs> uh, but, but what he did was, I'm going to ignore it, don't worry, I've been ignoring him for 20 years, so. Um, what, he, what, he, what he's doing is he's really giving bipartisanship a chance. And again, I think it's sincere, but even if it's not, it's a great electoral measure because in two years, when they go to the voters in midterm elections, if the Republicans continue to do what they did with the stimulus package, which is slap his hand when he reaches out to them, that's going to be a magnificently powerful issue for Barack Obama to then go from district to district and say, we tried, they won't play ball, so now you need to elect us. I, th I think it's just a masterful <coughs> job. I also think it's sincere, which it makes it even better. So, so, what, so uh, I, again, I, uh, I, I've not fallen in love with the you know, Obama mania, but I have been, been very impressed with him, uh, uh, his personal style, his ability to... You know, it was just so nice to see him string five sentences together. And, yeah. and to really, to, to, to be, just, and I don't want to do any bush bashing, but to have a president that you can say, God, I, he's, he's a pleasure to listen to, is so damn refreshing. A uh, students say that about my class, at, no, oh, my oh, class, <laughs> after they've been in yours. Yeah. I thought it was the reverse, but go on. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> a, a, any surprises so far? <clears throat> I know no. it's really short term, but any surprises? No, I, and, I, I, I was going to, I was, I actually uh, think he's off to a very good start, certainly compared to how we started the Clinton administration. Uh, no disrespect um, to a president I admire greatly and who I think found his legs at, at some point and had a terrific presidency. But uh, if you'll remember the Clinton administration, there were problems getting his appointments out. His selection of initial issues was extremely controversial. Um, his big policy initiatives got pushed back pretty quickly. In contrast here, I mean, despite these vetting issues and who knows where the problem lies, it's not great, but these things happen. But look at what he's done in just less than two months. He got this stimulus bill passed. Now, God only knows if it's going to work, <laughs> but if it does, uh, that's going to be looked back as quite an accomplishment. And as you suggested, it's going to put the Republicans in a terrible hole because they decided as a strategy to vote against it, particularly in the House, and, and they could live to regret it. He gave a terrific speech the other night and introduced a budget. That budgets are enormous documents. They're not easy to cobble together. But that reflected every single uh, position that he enunciated in the course of that campaign, whether it's taxes or health care or investment and, and different things, education alike. He got that out on the table and has taken the first step uh, 
towards getting that budget approved and begun that dialogue. He announced a drawdown in Iraq, on Iraq. Again, people might quibble about the forces, the size of the forces to be left, but he made good on a promise and he took action right away. He started this health care uh, debate uh, discussion today under circumstances where some people might say, look, you got your hands full with the economy. What are you doing? Um, uh, putting on the table uh, a program that could potentially cost hundreds of billions more, and he said, I'm moving forward. Um, and I think you can, you know, there's a handful of other things on which he's already uh, shown leadership, sees the agenda, uh, started moving forward, and he's doing it with a skeletal um, team. He's doing it with a very skeletal team. So I am quite impressed so far. I will say also he handles himself extraordinarily well. I'll just point to one other thing that I, I think was very clever. You know, his first interview was with this Al Arabiya station. And the symbolism of it and the message it sent to the world was extraordinary. And he's, you know, it's not the biggest thing, but there have been a dozen or more of these little uh, gestures and actions that really are quite consistent with the the administration he said he was going to run, and, and, and I for one think he's off to an extraordinary start given the difficulties, and at least from my experience, of pulling these things off. Many people think of only health care in L.A. County with King Drew and all the issues that have occurred there, but talk a little bit about health care, the county, Obama, and, and what you see coming. Well, there are a couple of things that occurred to me, um, if I may. I think um, his launching of his um, uh, administration has been marked by a high level of energy uh, that has been very positive and it has been somewhat riveting uh, as it relates to uh, his focused work ethic. Uh, you do not get the impression that you have a, um, a president who's messing around, who's fooling around, who isn't on the case taking the job very, very seriously. In other words, honoring his oath. Uh, and I think that's hugely important uh, as a uh, consistent uh, message that's true to who he is as a person and a leader. Um, the question was raised earlier about the matter of infrastructure. And I think we can think about the physical interest infrastructure, and I think that's much of what um, was being referenced earlier, uh, but I, I want to uh, make uh, the point about the human infrastructure uh, of the nation, and more specific than that, the uh, the state of California and the and the county of Los Angeles, uh, and therein lies the discussion that we do need to have about the question of health care. Uh, it is fundamentally important, and. Uh, the health care delivery system in the county of Los Angeles is seriously broken. Um, and uh, the discussions around the Martin Luther King Medical Center is just one uh, manifestation of it, maybe the most um, um, extreme manifest manifestation of it from uh, a certain uh, point of view. But nonetheless, it affects the entirety of the county's safety net. Uh, be mindful of the fact that the county of Los Angeles uh, essentially is a, uh, a $23 billion corporation. Uh, a significant portion of that, uh, uh, nearing 30% uh, of that roughly, um, is uh, spent in the area of health care. Um, and uh, to the extent that that is the case, you get a sense of, of the um, magnitude of uh, the task uh, before us. Now, as it relates to the stimulus package, uh, the Recovery Act, as it were, um, there is a rather uh, clear agenda on the health care front that speaks to information technology. Uh, and so anybody who's trying to figure out what's going on with the stimulus package is really beaming on uh, the with laser-like focus, uh, the IT stuff, uh, because that's where huge payoffs are in terms of efficiencies and quality of care. And therefore, uh, with respect to the county of Los Angeles, 
uh, that's uh, uh, Professor Guerra where we are focusing much of our attention. The Three billion dollar uh, proposal from the County of Los Angeles, a half billion of it is uh, focused on the Martin Luther King Medical Center as well as uh, the Harbor UCLA uh, Medical Center. Two very, very important pieces of the county's safety network and its delivery system. So I'm going to let the students start asking some questions, but I want to ask you two more, really more political questions than anything else. About three weeks ago in this class, we talked about the uh, significant positions in L.A. County, including not only the supervisors, but the congressional delegation, et cetera. And we had this pyramid of positions. And um, uh, on the pyramid, County Board of Supervisors was at the, the second tier of many tiers, meaning that it's really one of the most powerful positions. You just heard him say $23 billion budget. Uh, you represent 2 million people in your own district, 10 million overall. A significant position. The only position we put above that was mayor of L.A. We put under that members of Congress, you know, so, and, and we did that for a variety of different reasons, some interviews with electeds and all that. So in this pyramid, there's never been a violation in 50 years in terms of people moving up, not back. So this pyramid would suggest that you would not run for U.S. Congress, given that even if there was an open seat, even if I were to say to you, hey, just say it, and, and you're a member of Congress. The only position above that was mayor of Los Angeles, or of course, statewide office. So have you, I know it's only four months in the job already, but um, would you ever consider running for mayor of Los Angeles? Not, you know, obviously Antonio just got reelected, so, you know, he can answer about four years from now. We won't remember. Um, I'm nearing the first 100 days in uh, office as a member of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Um, and we are focused on empowering uh, communities and uh, delivering results. Uh, we're attempting to make a difference in that way with a highly uh, skilled uh, a group of people who are determined to distinguish, uh, distinguish our work. There are uh, things that are attractive about being the chief executive of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, but there are things that uh, supervisors can do that a mayor cannot. Uh, supervisors do not have to get permission from uh, the city council before the budget is passed. When we act, it's done. Uh, be mindful of the fact that in the city of Los Angeles, it is, quote, unquote, a weak mayor system. The city council is the board of directors. And there is hardly anything that the mayor uh, can do absent uh, the consent of the city uh, council. Uh, the mayor has a lot less discretionary uh, authority than is the case with the members of the Board of Supervisors, individually and uh, collectively. Uh, and so I'd have to think long and hard about foregoing my current uh, opportunities uh, to become uh, a mayor of any particular city. Uh, but I'm uh, a guy who's pretty focused on the task that's ahead of him. The mayor serves for eight years, supervisors serve for 12 years. And if you want continuity of leadership and the ability to really get projects done, uh, you look for long-term opportunities to work uh, uh, effectively. So there's a whole lot of things that uh, commend uh, being a supervisor over against being a mayor of, of any uh, given city in the state of California, including that of Los Angeles. He gets a nice house. I'm sorry? He gets a real nice house to live in. I'm not complaining about where I live in Lamert Park. Okay. You know? <laughs> uh, and, um, and when I was a member of the legislature, uh, the mayor lived uh, uh, in the district that I represented, so he was a constituent of mine. Um. You have been a longtime observer, participant, and commentator of black politics. Um, has Obama changed what we mean by black politics, uh, African American empowerment? Um, does it change how you, as an African American elected leader, feel about what you can do or how you go about doing things? 
What, what has changed for African-American politics because of the election of Obama? I believe that it is um, without a question that uh, his uh, ethnic background is a factor in how he is uh, to be evaluated, particularly from a historical perspective when you think about a breakthrough moment um, for uh, this person of color uh, being elected to the highest post uh, in uh, the land and then to be considered the leader of the quote-unquote uh, free world. So there's no two ways uh, to deny that when you look about, look at it in the context of the history uh, of this nation and, and the history uh, of racial politics, the, the history of prejudice, uh, bigotry, when you think about the Voting Rights Act, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, and all those things that are really uh, significant moments in terms of the narrative that we call uh, the American political s saga. It is, uh, without uh, question, uh, a moment to be interpreted in terms of the racial politics of the nation and beyond. But I would hasten to add that we are unwise when we think about African-American political uh, leadership in monolithic terms. Um, it is just simply not the case that all African-American uh, elected officials behave the same way, think the same uh, way, and have the same uh, priorities. Uh, and we have a lot of examples uh, to that effect. Uh, my predecessor and I share some things in common, but we are very different. Uh, some of the people with whom I have served in the legislature and the city uh, council, the same would be the case. Much like is the case with um, other ethnic groups who are office holders. And so I don't know uh, that it is fully clear as to what impact uh, the uh, Obama phenomenon will have in terms of African-American politics other than to say when the call came forward, black people did not miss the opportunity to salute this candidacy because in so doing they were saluting their history and their destiny. That was a vote for Frederick Douglass. That was a vote for Sojourner Truth, a vote for Martin King, and every other significant African-American luminary and those who have identified with the cause of freedom, justice, equality in the context of the American experience. And to some extent, surely all of us appreciate that that's larger than Barack Obama. And I would hasten to make the point, it was not uh, the African-American community that was initially excited about his candidacy. It wasn't simply uh, the Congressional Black Caucus who was slow on the uptake. Some of them never got it right and are still trying to figure out how to get it right. Uh, the four representatives from the state of California, three of them, didn't deal with it in the way Barbara Lee was the only African-American congressional representative who voted uh, in supporting Barack Obama. I guess the point that I would make is, is his appeal is much broader than any single ethnic group. It just so happens that his sojourn, his story, his narrative, his biography speaks profoundly to the experience of being black in America. Does it change the way we talk about race? I mean, when I first met you, you're one of the few public figures that is comfortable talking about race, about multiculturalism, about uh, dialogue. Um, are we, do you see collectively us being more comfortable talking about race? Not yet. Um, and frankly, um, I think he's just doing the work. Uh, the, the stimulus package, as we describe it, doesn't have a, a racial banner attached to it. Uh, Health care issues that he's attempting to address uh, are not um, shrouded in 
uh, racial rhetoric. Uh, the, the, foreclo the foreclosure phenomenon, obviously it affects uh, disproportionately persons of color in some ways, but that's just not what he pushes. And so I think his um, concerns are more fundamental. Uh, and the politics of race, the analysis of race, the sociology of race relations, the theology of what it means to be um, uh, a Jew versus being uh, a Latino versus being uh, an Asian Pacific Islander uh, is uh, what he understands in the background of his consciousness, but his work, the foreground, is to essentially to make it have appeal to a broad number of people. Questions, students, comments? Yeah, why don't you take one over here and then we'll go right here. Uh, okay. A little louder. <laughs> uh, many, many economists, and recently the LA Times, uh, that one of the best factors to stimulate the economy now is to legalize marijuana. Uh, Honorable Dr. Supervisor, would you agree? And uh, do you think we should start implementing that in California? And I would like to see what the other panelists think too. Thank yeah. you. Um, the, there's actually been some legislation introduced in, at the state by one of your former colleagues, Amiano. Oh, I don't know that he was there. At, oh yeah, he was there at the same time in the legislature. He came after I was yeah, gone. Okay. So uh, legalize marijuana, should we legalize it? Well, it's an interesting discussion, and it's not just a linguistic uh, leap uh, to talk about the difference between legalization and decriminalization. Um, if you can't get it decriminalized, I don't know how you think you can get it legalized, but it generated a lot of headlines for uh, the assemblyman. Uh, the best that has been sought uh, has been to talk about it in terms of the uh, the efficacy of uh, marijuana use in terms of uh, medicinal purposes. Uh, but no, I don't know that uh, I have a sense that uh, uh, the legalization or the decriminalization of marijuana has a significant um, <laughs> impact in terms of economic stimulus. As a matter of fact, uh, given the fact that it isn't a stimulant, it might have the reverse <laughs> effect. <laughs> so, now why would you ask me a crazy ass question like that? Well, <laughs> what, what is this? Uh, what school is this, anyway? That, that, he, he's one of Dr. Genevieve's students. Yeah, I see, all right. Appreciate the question, man. I don't claim him. <laughs> hey, Phil, what do you think about this, though? Uh, I, I, I haven't thought about it, um, and, I, and I missed the uh, report a, on the he, economic analysis. He was in the analysis. Clinton administration. Remember that, what they did, huh? Yeah, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't inhale. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's probably dangerous. I, I, I'm going to endorse the supervisor's response here and embr embrace his political wisdom. I, I, I also have no. Okay, no Dr. Genovese. <laughs> I turn it over to you, Fernando, for you. Now, um, I fully support uh, the medical uses of marijuana, and right now I have some lower back pain, so I... Yeah, uh, no. right. <laughs> no, I, I actually, I, I, I'm not too high on uh, legalization <laughs> of marijuana. I didn't, didn't think he'd get that. He's, uh, get what? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Can we have a question over here? Hello. Um, well, uh, this question is for uh, Dr. Genovese. Um, we see that President Obama has uh, chosen a lot of uh, his cabinet picks from Congress and from sitting governors. Would you consider that a rookie mistake, or did he make a, the right call with these uh, appointments? Yeah, and is that unusual? Have previous? I mean, it seems to me an inordinate amount of governors and sitting U.S. senators and congressmen got elected to the cabinet, whereas like Nixon hardly had any. So I mean, well, Nixon wanted a more anonymous administration that he could dominate. I think Obama is so secure in and of himself that he can bring in strong people around him. Um, is it unusual? Yes, it is unusual. Is it a mistake? Um, a lot of his supporters thought so. They said, well, we, we wanted change, we wanted something new, and now you're bringing in all the old timers. The only way you're going to get change is if you have people who know where things, where the bodies are buried, how to build legislation, how to build coalitions. 
And so my, my take on it is to watch the way Barack Obama manages his administration. Uh, there was a good article in the Times today about all the czars that he's been appointing. Um, that has the potential for being a problem for democratic politics, but it also has the possibility of really getting a few things done. So, so better to look at Barack Obama's management of his administration and his willingness to bring <coughs> strong people in who will at times talk back to him, which is so essential. Very few presidents are comfortable with that. My sense is that Barack Obama is, and I think that's one of the greatest attributes that he has. Well, I think one of the interesting things about it, it as you measure them, um, assess them, is to ask the question, are they really uh, agent, agents for change? I mean, that was the metaphor for his uh, campaign. Um, and governance is different from campaigning. We do appreciate that. But even uh, so, the consciousness of change seems to me to be really rather important in order to uh, fulfill the promises of the campaign. And it, that doesn't happen from uh, a single person. You need a change-oriented team in order to bring about a substantial change at that level. I, I, I agree with what's been said on both sides. I guess I, I would just emphasize that uh, th this point that was just made, there's a difference between campaigning and governing. And again, just comparing my experience in the Clinton administration, not to fault the president I admire so much, but I think one reason why the Clinton administration got off to a slow start is that too many people with terrific campaign abilities and experience came in and were appointed to positions to govern and they had never, they didn't have the same talents on the governing side. Uh, I commend this president for putting the campaign people aside and saying now we're going to pick the governing team and for picking an extraordinarily experienced bunch of people and also for not getting hung up in who was a Hillary person and who was an Obama person. Um, I was a bit involved in the transition and I can tell you that the people that were brought in, um, the transition team and the cabinet as well is filled with Clinton people filled with Clinton people, and at least in my experience, these were the best and the brightest. And to this president's credit, he's not hung up on that stuff. He doesn't bear grudges. I think he wanted the best, and my hope is that he'll get it. I'll just add one last thing on this business of the czars. Um, I think it takes, uh, first of all, he, he has a lot of self-confidence to bring all these smart people in and, 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 and not be intimidated by any of them. I, my, my one concern is he's bringing a lot of smart people in with overlapping responsibilities, and there are, by necessity, human nature and alike going to be turf fights. And I hope that that doesn't wind up being a disabling factor as opposed to an energizing factor. I, I think the jury's out a little bit. We haven't seen this kind of structure in the White House in a long, long time. But again, uh, my initial sense is this guy's instincts are quite extraordinary. I think he has a pretty good idea how he wants to do it. Um, the fact that he's so young and has really not served in government that much and he's able to get off to this kind of start and be so thoughtful in what he's doing, I, I think is just extraordinary. Hard to almost comprehend, but uh, we'll see. Hopefully it yeah. stays good. Um, Dr. Professor Genovese, Mr. Philip Reck Esquire, the Honorable Dr. Supervisor Mark Willie Thomas, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.